All right, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation with Janine on sea slugs and their friends. Janine Breaker has worked in marine science research for more than 30 years for government agencies, universities, research orgs, NGOs, and as a sole trader. Her diverse marine work has included mathematical modeling of fishery stocks, SA marine benthic surveys to 20 meters, marine parks research, and marine species conservation assessments. Since 2011, she has managed citizen science projects that document sea slugs and other marine vertebrates around South Australia. The projects have re revealed new, undescribed, previously unrecorded species and expanded the known range of numerous other invertebrate species. In 2015, Janine created the community-based Neville Coleman Memorial Nudibranch Dive Event, which runs each summer in SA. Janine currently has two careers, one in marine science, so one in marine citizen science project management and the other in primary special education. Wow, it's incredible. Thank you very much, Janine, for coming back again to give a presentation. We've had you on a couple thank of times me. for the for the uh, National Science Week presentations. So thank you everybody for coming along this evening on Zoom and also Facebook Live to have a chat about sea slugs and their friends. Um, we're very lucky here in South Australia that we have so many different sea slug species. We've got a mix of globally distributed species that are found all over the world and a lot of tropical Indo-Pacific ones as well. Some that are found mainly across all of Southern Australia and some endemic or narrow range ones that so far have been found only here in South Australia. We have hundreds of different species of sea slugs here. And they are very, very diverse in their form and in their function. And um, we're just going to have a look at what they actually are. What are sea slugs? They are soft bodied mollusks um, in the clade heterobranchia. The heterobranchs uh, literally means different guild. So sea slugs are related to both the land snails and the slugs. Originally it was thought that they were separate, but they are very closely related to the land slugs and snails. They're about at least 2,500 species around the world, probably more, and there are new finds very often. Um, so we really don't know how many there are, but more are being found all the time. Some of them have thin shells and others have small internal shells and some of them have no shells at all, the so-called nudibranchs, which means naked gills. And they're found throughout the marine environment from the shallows right down to very deep water. So on the left here is an example of one that my daughter and I found just in a shallow rock pool at Aldinga, um, Mexichromus macropus. So that's in uh, really shallow water, only about 30, 40 centimetres of water. Um, I mentioned that new ones are found all the time or the range, ranges of ones that are known are uh, expanded quite often. So here's um, the first record that we found um, in a brown algae sample that was collected by Ralph and um, uh, who's joining us this evening. And this is uh, a South, South uh, Eastern Australian species and um, this was the first record that was found in South Australia. They're also found in very deep water and here's a new one that's, that has been found quite recently I think in 2009 from 600 metres deep where it's very cold and dark and very high pressure um, in Oregon in USA. So sea slugs are found all over the place. Um, Right, we'll just go on to the next one. So there's a lot of different groups of sea slugs. Um, we start with the bubble shells. So these ones do have an external shell, just like other gastropod um, snails. And that group also includes the head shield slugs, which we'll have a look at in a minute. There's also the umbrella shells, which are quite unusual. This genus Tylodena, there's only one in southern Australia here, and they have a little external shell. They're quite brightly coloured, they're yellow, um, and they do eat sponges and take up some of the chemicals from the sponge. So um, um, they can exude fluid when, when they're alarmed. Um, we also have 
the rhodopomorph slugs, which are very small. They look a little bit like worms. And these ones are usually found in, um, in between sand grains. So very hard to see, but uh, some divers with great eyesight, like Anita Futter here, she actually found one without sieving through sand. <laughs> um, there's also the sap-sucking sea slugs. Um, and these ones um, have, um, that they eat algae and they can take up the chloroplasts from the algae um, and keep those within their body and photosynthesize just like plants. So they can eat, but also make their own food through that way. Then there's the sea hares down the bottom here. Um, sea hares have, um, uh, quite a large body and a long neck area near the head here and their um, rhinophores are quite um, quite long in some species and they look a little bit like a rabbit shape hence the name sea hare because they look a bit like a hare. Um, another group is the sea angels, um, the so-called um, the pteropods which are found in um, the open ocean so we don't see these close to shore um, and they have a little shell as well, and they spend their entire life out there in the plankton in the open ocean. Then there's the side gilled sea slugs, which can go pretty big. Um, we have one here to about 40 centimetres, so called side gill because they actually have a gill on the side. And then probably the most famous group of all, the nudibranchs. A nudibranch meaning naked gill because they have the gills outside of their body. Okay, so we're going to start with a little quiz now because we have a picture here taken by Adrian Wood of this delightful red fiery looking structure and for those of you who are on um, uh, who, who are joining in um, and can see this poll, we have um, we have uh, four options here of what this thing might be. And so the, the answers that you have to choose from, and I reckon divers would probably know this, but those of you who aren't divers might not, and it'll be interesting to see what the results are. Is this A, a red anemone that eats sea slugs? Is it B, the gills of a South Australian nudibranch? Is it C, the tentacle crown of a worm that's eaten by nudibranchs? Or is it D, a sea slug's egg chamber. And so far, we've only got one respondent, I think, but that's okay. And that person was correct. It actually is. Shall I end the poll? I can do that for you. Okay, let's end the poll. Okay, so that actually is the gills of a South Australian nudibranch. And here is that nudibranch, Hypsilodorus St. Vincentius, named after Gulf St. Vincent. It's very closely related to two other species in the tropics, Hypsilodorus obscura and Infocata. And this one is found in many different parts of South Australia. And so that picture that you were looking at before here is actually the gill ring. And you can see the gills here. So that's the way that the sea, that the nudibranchs breathe through this gill structure at the back. And they have these other little things at the front, which we will talk about very soon. So we mentioned gills. Gills are really important because when you're in the water, you have to be able to breathe. And sea slugs have got all different ways of breeding, depending on which kind of sea slug they are. So some nudibranchs have these rings, uh, have a ring of gills, like the one that we just saw towards the rear of the animal. Some of them have these little outgrowths of the mantle here. So little uh, tree-like extensions growing out from the mantle. The bubble shells have their gill inside and it's protected. The side gill sea slugs have their gills on the right hand side, again protected by the body. Um, and the head shield slugs um, also have their gill protected and not exposed. And here's a sea hare. They also have their gills inside protected by the mantle. So it's mainly the nudibranchs that have them outside um, uh, in, uh, in the seawater, um, exposed to the seawater. 
Okay, so normally I would ask um, if this was a live presentation, what are these things? So for those of you who are on Facebook Live, you might like to just write your answer down to question one, what these funny looking rabbit-like ear things are. And um, we won't wait too long for that. This is a beautiful picture of um, Corifolina, uh, previously Flabolina, by Daniel Kinas showing the structures. And these peculiar structures are rhinophores. Rhinophores uh, allow the nudibranch to sense the environment around it. So it's a little bit like um, a nose and a mouth together, I suppose. So it can sense chemicals in the water, but it also has particular cells inside that allow it to pick up vibrations and um, determine its orientation. So the nudibranch can determine whether it's right way up or upside down and can sense water currents as well. And so some rhinophores have little rings around them or little uh, book-like leaves um, which help to increase the surface area. And that's really important because that allows them to sense more from the environment around them. So here's an example from that Hypsilodorus that has these little book-like um, uh, uh, little sheets here. I, I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to hold that up. Um, here's an example of a photo by Di Fernie, and that, uh, that shows example of the so-called lamellae, which increase the surface area. That sea slugs do have eyes, but they're really not that important. They're mainly just for sensing light and dark. So I don't know if you can see that on these little green sap-sucking slugs here, but there's tiny little black spots. So that's the little eye spot on these animals. Um, most sea slugs have one pair of tentacles like this for sensing the environment and um, others have two. So this is question two, what are these things? So we've got some more tentacle-like extensions, but instead of coming up from the top of the sea slug, they're down the bottom near the mouth. So those of you on Facebook might like to write down your answer to question two, what do you think these funny extensions are? and uh, quite a lot of nudibranchs have them. They are oral tentacles. And here's an example of oral tentacles here on this tiny little um, nudibranch that are actually longer than the rhinophores. So these help the nudibranch to find their food, which is very important um, because the oral tentacles are very close to the mouth. Some of them, like this head shield slug here, we found this one on York Peninsula when we had a field trip back in 2013. It's an undescribed species. I don't know of any other examples from South Australia. And this is a beautiful photo of that animal by Leon Altoff. Um, these ones have little sensory hairs and that helps them find flatworms because they eat flatworms. Um, some of the sea slugs, um, particularly the aeolid nudibranchs, they eat hydroids, little uh, stinging animals. And this one here, which swims around, um, as well as landing on surfaces, this has a big oral hood here, like a vacuum cleaner. So this helps the mele slurp up um, plankton. So it eats amphipods and, and isopods, fish eggs, uh, I mean copepods, all those kinds of um, small animals in the plankton. And question three, for those of you who are writing down your answers, what are these strange looking pointy arrow things? What do we think they might be? Some sea slugs have these and some sea slugs don't. Let's have a look and see what they are. There's a variety of different shapes and colours. These are known as serrata and it's a little bit like having a set of arrows on your back to protect yourself because some of the sea slugs, they eat small stinging animals such as hydroids or they might eat anemones. And those small stinging animals have stinging cells, but the sea slugs can eat them without those cells firing um, because they have a mucus protected gastric tract. And so these little outgrowths are basically an extension of the digestive system. So the stinging cells, 
called nematocysts, they travel up into these little serrata on the back and into these little white areas at the end known as nidosacs. So it's basically a little sack of stinging cells that they can use for defense. So um, uh, there are various, um, various shapes and sizes. This is one from a, a tropical related eubranchus that we found on York Peninsula that has absolutely enormous balloon shaped serrata. There's all different kinds. Some can have them on the side like this Hancockia there's many different kinds. We are going to play a little game now called Where's the Slug? So those of you who are zooming in, you have an annotate button. If anyone would like to try and find the slug, this is a very typical kind of um, rubbly bottom habitat um, near a reef that would be very common habitat for different types of slugs because there's lots of things to eat, lots of hydroids, um, little bits of sponge, does anyone, um, would anyone like to circle where they think there might be a sea slug in this picture? Okay, so the main one here is this tiny little trepania here. So this is a small animal, it's only a couple of centimetres long. And there's the gill there and the rhinophore, and I think there's another tiny little one there. So that's another picture by Ralph uh, Daniel Kinez, and it's a very good example of how wonderfully camouflaged these little animals are. Um, so some of them really can be very small, and that is a great way of protecting yourself, is if you are small, you're not likely to be seen. So here's an example by Layla Nazimi. This is Layla's glove here and that's the stitching on the glove so you can see how small this little cretina is this one is only about one to two centimeters long when it's an adult but this one isn't even an adult yet so it's very very small here's another one this is the colpidapsis that was only about two millimeters long this was um, a new find by anita Futura. this is the first one we've seen of this one there are a number of species here but we don't know much about that one um, other examples here that only are about one to two centimetres long, and these are ones that we've found over on York Peninsula. Um, this was the first record of a southeastern species, Ilby, Ilby, that we found a few years ago. Um, and all of these are only about one to two um, millimetres long. These ones are really, really small. This one only two millimetres as well. And some of them get really big. Here is an example of a side gilled sea slug. This is Pleurobranchus, and that grows to about 40 centimetres. So this is one taken by Ben Florence on Kangaroo Island. This animal uh, eats ascidian, and sometimes um, at particular times of the year, there are very many of these together. So they tend to um, settle in an area, grow really fast, eat a lot, um, aggregate together, reproduce, and then they may die out after a time and then they may come back in some other years. So side gill sea slugs, a little bit like the sea hares, um, have these variable recruitments where sometimes you see a lot of them and sometimes you don't. So this is a really big, heavy type of animal um, as far as slugs go. We also have another fairly large one, and Carl showed me a picture today of one which was about 15 centimetres long, which is about the maximum size of this famous nudibranch, Ceratosoma brevicordatum. And this one is found in so many different habitats. You'll find it down on rubbly sea floors and on reef and on um, sponges, seagrass. It's found just about everywhere. And it's the most, one of the most common ones that we have here. And it's likely to be seen by both divers and snorkelers because it really stands out. It's a very, very bright animal. And normally I would ask students, why do you think it's bright? And if we had our microphones turned on, you could tell me why. And that would be because it is toxic. So this particular one eats uh, sponges and it takes up the compounds from the sponges in its uh, body and it also has a little poison gland which you can see here um, just there behind the gill there's a little gland so this one is one of our large and um, delicious looking nudibranchs that 
animals in the sea just don't eat. <laughs> we do get some really big ones in the world, bigger than the ones here in South Australia e even. Some of the tropical ones, such as the Spanish dancer, that can grow to at least 40 centimetres. This one, which goes all the way from California to Alaska, that's about 30 centimetres. So again, as long as a ruler, that one eats tube anemones. And this monstrous slug um, from America grows to more than 75 centimetres. So there's even been a record of this slug at one metre, which is huge for, <laughs> for a slimy marine invertebrate, and about 14 kilos, so heavier than some people's dogs. <laughs> and that's just one slug. <laughs> so there's an example there next to the diver's foot. Okay, so... The other thing about sea slugs is that they eat all different things in the marine environment. And that is good because that means they have a variety of different ecological functions. Sponge is a very common food for, for some sea slugs. Some of them live on sponges, they breed on sponges and they eat sponges. Here's an example of Viconia vercoi, um, named after the famous South Australian naturalist, Joseph Verco. This one lives on this beautiful pink Apicilla sponge. It looks just like the sponge. So amazing camouflage and it eats the sponge and it breeds on the sponge. Um, here's that famous Ceratosoma um, and the South Australian Hypsilodorus here, um, possibly having a food fight. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, an amazing picture by Wally Pillen. Um, some of them live on hydroids, so these are the little uh, stinging, stinging animals that are related to jellyfish and corals. So here's one uh, that eats the hydroids and stores the stinging cells in these little sacs here in the serrata. Um, some of them actually eat other nudibranchs. So this gymnodorus, although it's quite a small uh, sea slug, it can eat these kind of aeolid nudibranchs, the ones with the stinging cells. So, um, yes, not very common for um, sea slugs to eat other sea slugs. And this beautiful one, Tanger verconis, this eats this blue bryozoan called Bugler. And so it's found in not very many parts of South Australia because it's only found where its food is found. Um, some of them eat anemones. Here's an example of one anemone eater from York Peninsula. Some of them eat soft corals. So this Albany marionia, which was named by Neville Coleman, um, uh, the common name, I think it's still undescribed. This one looks very similar to the polyps of the coral. So, and it's the same color as well. So quite well camouflaged. And there's quite a few of these on York Peninsula where this particular coral proliferates. Some of them, as I mentioned before, eat algae. So here's one that is very, very well camouflaged on a green seaweed called Calerpa simpliciuscula. And this blue dragon uh, is, is related to tropical species. They can grow to a fair size. This is a juvenile one. They eat uh, small stinging animals, but they can also um, cultivate zooxanthellae um, in their tissues and photosynthesize. So they can make their own plant, own food, just like some of these um, algae eaters can. Um, this one, Bernier helicocorda, I wanna show you a little video um, by a colleague of mine, Audrey Falconer from the Marine Research Group of the Field Nats of Victoria. Um, this is named after Bob Byrne, who is a famous nudibranch um, biologist here in Australia. This is Bernier, and we'll have a look in a minute. And it's eating a stalk jellyfish, which is quite a rare animal here in Australia, um, not found um, in very many places in Southern Australia, possibly because they're so small. Um, and they're quite an unusual group globally, really. So here's the Bernier munching away, on this stalk jellyfish. So it's gone in to try and uh, eat the mouth <laughs> and it's got the little tentacles around there. It's got the animal uh, stuck on its head. Um, so I won't go through the whole video, but over time, this animal um, can eat the whole thing. And here's the serrata 
um, and you can see little pieces of the digestive tract of this animal go up here um, in each of the serifs. And there's the little uh, sacs where the stinging cells are held. So um, we'll leave him to his dinner of the rare jellyfish, stalk jellyfish, and we'll move to the next thing. Okay, so how do sea slugs make more sea slugs? Um, like your garden snails, they are hermaphrodites, so they're both male and female together. And they mate usually with um, the right side of the animal to the other right side of, of the, the mating animal, the, the paired animal here. They mate through a particular chamber and some animals such as the sea hares and the bubble shells, they have separate male and female ap apertures so they can form mating chains. Here's some examples, some beautiful photos by Carolyn Landert. Um, she's got a number of photos of sea slugs mating. <laughs> And they're, yeah, uh, very, very interesting um, examples here. So after the deed is done, um, they can store the sperm for a while. And then um, when the eggs are finally fertilized, um, they can lay their eggs in a mass of protective jelly. So here's an example by Robert Payton of these um, beautiful Gonia brancus. Uh, I think they're on a um, razorfish shell here, um, laying a coiled egg mass. So in this jelly, there's hundreds of tiny little eggs. Here's an example of one of those stinging ones um, that's laying the egg mass on the hydroid, which is the food that they eat. Here's another one. Um, this one forms a little egg packet here, and this is in a uh, spaghetti bryozoan. This particular one is associated with the introduced spaghetti bryozoan. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, here's a lovely golden egg mass from this tamja by David Muirhead. Um, here's another example. Um, I think I took this one at my Ponga quite a few years ago. You can see um, eggs within the mass there. And these sea hares, they lay these weird kind of strings that look a little bit like hocking noodles. And there can be quite a large amount of these, of these, um, these strings laid at certain times of the year. So there are many adaptations that sea slugs have. And um, middle primary students learn about adaptations as part of their science course. So normally I would ask what some of the adaptations people can see in here, but because we can't question at the moment, we'll just go through some of them. So we talked about the weapons, um, the nido sacs on the back of the serrata here, and the poison gland here in this serratosoma. So it does have warning coloration to say, look but don't eat. Size is another great way to protect yourself. If you're small, you can hide. Some of them are very cryptic, really well camouflaged. So here is this beautiful Scalia um, sea slug and uh, it's got these little wing-like parapodia coming out of the side and it looks very, very similar to the wireweed, the, the amphibolus um, that it is next to in this photo. Um, this particular one um, is very well camouflaged on sponge and that's one of the sponge eating ones and it's the same colour as the sponge that it eats. And this one we talked about before as well, the wonderful pink um, verconia that lives on the pink sponge. So very well camouflaged, some of these species. We'll have a little chat about sap like sap sucking sea slugs. That's really hard to say because there are so many different ones. These are the herbivorous ones and most of them eat green seaweeds. They have this knife-like radula teeth all joined together and that allows them to pierce the cell walls of algae and suck out the contents. And we mentioned that some of them can store and use the photosynthetic chlor chloroplast from their plant food. Some of them have a little shell um, and some of them don't. Some have serrata on the dorsal side. Others have these wing-like parapodia that help them move along. Some of them can even flap the parapodia and, um, and I wouldn't say swim, but they can certainly move along that way. 
Um, here's some more examples here. This is a widespread Indo-Pacific one. Um, this eats a common green seaweed called Calerpa, and it can drop its tail if disturbed, just like a lizard. So that's an, that's an interesting adaptation to help the slug get away and leave its tail behind. Um, this is another one that looks very similar to the seaweeds that it eats. And I wanted to include this one because last year when I did scuba in the pub talk before COVID lockdown, um, we had a little drawing session. I asked people to draw their favourite sea slug or one that they might imagine themselves. And Amy Woolridge drew this beautiful sap sucking sea slug here, which actually looks very similar to the saproteas here. Um, Okay, so we're going to play another little game now. Where's the slugs? So this is actually the sea slug. And as you can see, it's very, very well camouflaged. This one here. And it's got all these fine little um, hairy-like um, extensions uh, on the mantle, very similar to the surfaces that it's crawling around on. So what are these things? These weird, hairy sea hairs. This is a really unusual animal, um, Bursatella, um, mainly found in Western Australia. And it was uncommon to see aggregations of this animal in South Australia. But from about 2018 onwards, divers started noticing these weird hairy sea hairs at some coastal dive sites and bays in South Australia, both here in the Gulf and also over on York Peninsula. And this is related to a tropical species, but um, Matt Nims from Southern Cross Uni is, um, he has uh, described this as a separate species, a separate Southern species. It's uh, found in WASA and rare examples in Victoria. It's possibly um, increasing in number here because of our warmer summers. We've had um, about five or six years where we've had the warmest sea surface temperatures on record and this uh, would provide good conditions for these slugs to proliferate here. So this shaggy slug uh, eats small algae. So here's an example of one here and they tend to have boom and bust populations. So that could be according to tides and currents and various weather conditions that affect the larval supply. So how many larvae can reach a particular area and their food supply, variations in food supply. So here's another video by Daniel. I'll just show you a little example here of this one just schluffing along, um, sensing its food. So here's an example, it's looking at it's sensing its um, environment around it and possibly feeding as well. It's got a little mouth under there. Um, here's another example here. It's got these little oral tentacles and it's got the rhinophores on top. Okay, we might move on um, to the dorids because there are hundreds of different species of dorid nudibranch and some of the world's most spectacular ones are in this group. They're often oval shaped like this and they have a little mantle skirt um, some of them may be ornamented. They have various little tubercles and pustules and things. A lot of them eat sponges. Some of them uh, eat bryozoans, which are uh, small colonial animals, and ascidians. Some of them are even cannibals and eat other dorid nudibranchs. And the ones that eat sponges, they use um, enzymes in their pharynx and they turn the sponge into soup and then slurp it into the stomach. We have very many species of dorid nudibranch. Here's a number of undescribed ones. So even here in South Australia, um, there are species that haven't been named yet. And because the Doridae is such a big family, it may take many years before um, animals are compared with others from around the world. Um, so this one, the Edith Bird Doris, this has remained unnamed for decades here in South Australia. Um, we talked a little bit about the Aeolid nudibranchs, um, the ones that have the serrata. Um, because they feed on stinging animals such as anemones and corals, hydroids or stalk jellyfish. And here's some examples of these type of nudibranchs that store the stinging cells in their serrata on the back. So we've got this one here, Cerberilla, 
and um, some other examples here. I wanted to mention marine hitchhikers because we do have a number of species here that don't come from South Australia. And um, in recent times, uh, there have been even more of these settling in South Australia. In some years, um, they may come in on currents during the summer and then they would die out during the autumn. But now populations tend to persist for much longer now. There is example of this one, Spirilla brasiliana, um, from South America, which is also found in many parts of the Pacific now. It's been known in Australia since about the 1990s, I think, in Queensland and New South Wales. But the first record in South Australia was 2015. And now it seems to be spreading west. There are records from York Peninsula now. Um, and possibly spread over to Air Peninsula. So here's some uh, egg masses of this one from down at um, O'Sullivan's Beach. So it's certainly breeding here. And one of the Reef Watch uh, people, Thelma Bridal, she's been monitoring the Spirilla uh, down at Aldinga Reef because they've been breeding down there for a number of years. Uh, here's another example. This one uh, found uh, all over. Um, the Pacific and various other areas. This is Doto Pitta. This is the first example in South Australia that we know of, of Doto Pitta. I found this one at Ardrossan a few years ago. Here's one that Dan Monceau recorded, quite well camouflaged in this picture, an absolutely beautiful looking animal. This is Godiva. And again, this is one that does not come from South Australia and has been found here in recent years. And this little one from Japan, Dematobranchus, um, has been recorded in recent years from Wallaroo and Port Hughes. Here's some other examples of small nudibranchs that are moving all around the world. This, uh, it, this image in the background here is spaghetti bryozoan. And um, uh, this is not native to South Australia, but it has been found in uh, port areas in particular. Um, Amathia verticillata. And there's a little nudibranch here, this Orkinia, that, um, that eats this particular spaghetti bryozoan. And what we've found over the past probably seven, eight years um, on York Peninsula, that uh, this spaghetti bryozoan is, is expanding its distribution. So uh, it was originally found at Coffin Bay and Port Adelaide in the 70s, but wasn't recorded at other areas. Um, it started proliferating at Port at uh, Wallaroo, and now we've found that it's spread all over to the other side of the York Peninsula, um, places like Stansbury and um, and Edith Berg and a diver I know who has dived Stansbury for about 20 years or more, he had never seen this spaghetti bryozoan until about 2015. So the warmer summers um, and the, the longer periods of warm water that we're having right into autumn now um, are facilitating the expansion of this kind of, um, this kind of bryozoan and the animals that go with it, this Archenia species. This Indo-Pacific species was probably first recorded here in 2017. Um, that's the first record I'm aware of anyway, and South Australia was not listed as part of the distribution. This picture is by Sean Ruxton, and um, it has been found in a number of other parts of York Peninsula since then. Uh, same with this one, Orkenia um, echinata from Japan, previously known from Eastern Australia, but this was also found um, in 2019, that picture by Deb Aston there, showing that it's got quite, uh, um, yeah, quite extensive, um, elaborate um, outgrowths. Okay, so um, we might just quickly talk about head shield slugs because these are quite unusual animals. There's bubble shells, sea hares, and head shield slugs all in the same major group. Some of them have a little internal shell and some have a fragile shell outside. The head shell slugs are quite unusual. They're often found down in the sand or near reefs and seagrass beds. They have this little shield at the front and that helps them plough through the sand and it stops the sand entering their mantle. 
rectal cavity. And they've got quite well-developed sensory structures on the front there as well, which can help them detect their prey. This one's Philanopsis trubigensis, named after Trubridge Island, um, and they're quite common over on York Peninsula there. Some of them have little fleshy wing-like parapodia on the sides of the body. Um, some of them are also found in tropical areas. Here's one from Mozzie Flat on Southern York Peninsula there. Okay, I'm going to show um, a video here uh, by Maggie McLean. And this, I think, was the first video that um, Maggie has ever made. And it's a great example of some of the features of nudie breaks here. So we can see this um, Hypsilodorus moving along here. You can see the gill ring and it's moving around, sensing its environment and you can see the mouth there. Oh, there's a fish just passing through. These rhinophores, um, in many species, they can retract back into a little sheath to protect themselves. Um, this one didn't, didn't retract. Um, here's the ceratosoma again and this I don't know why it keeps stopping, sorry about this. So you can see this one has quite a feathery type of gill. You can't really see the poison gland on this one. Um, and here's one of those little versatella hairy sea hairs here. Um, don't know why it's going into this tunicate. <laughs> no food in there. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you, Maggie. Let's move on. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Neville Coleman event, um, which is um, an event that we have here in South Australia every year since 2015. And it's named after this person, Neville Coleman, um, a multi-talented person who um, unfortunately died uh, before his, his time was up, I would say. And um, he's... Uh, um, an amazing photographer and a naturalist. Um, he's found so many different species um, and helped a number of museums to do a lot of work over the years. He's taken thousands and thousands of photos and collected many of the first known specimens, not only here in Southern Australia and in Eastern Australia, but right through the Indo-Pacific. And he's written so many books. He has an amazing movie Brank encyclopedia, um, which is pretty much the Bible for people who like nudie branks. There are a couple of other good ones out there, but this is a, a very common one that's used here. And we started the Neville Coleman event in honor of Neville um, because he was a great marine educator as well as an author. And it's a way of celebrating the nudibranch and sea slug fauna of South Australia as well, so that people can get to know a bit more about the extraordinary diversity here um, through photography. And it's, um, it brings together people from different dive shops, different clubs, um, and people right throughout the community. We've got people from four different states now who entered the competition. Last year, we had more than 40 divers and snorkelers participating and um, about 300 images were entered in the photography competition. Uh, we have judges uh, of the photo competition, marine photographers and also scientific judges from around Australia and around the world. And we have a number of categories here and we have prizes donated very kindly by individuals and also by um, uh, organisations and uh, dive clubs, uh, sorry, dive shops um, from Scuba Pro here and, um, and um, Adelaide Scuba. So it's a, it's a nice event. Um, for bringing people together to celebrate sea slugs held every summer. I wanted to put a little plug in for iNaturalist because if you go out and you have a camera with you and you find a sea slug, whether it's on the beach or uh, washed up or in a rock pool or, um, or if you're out swimming um, or diving and you have an underwater camera or snorkeling, you could put it on to iNaturalist. There's also an app on, on your phone as well that can be put on um, 
uh, a number of us in South Australia have started up projects on iNaturalist over the past couple of years. I'd say uh, Dan Monceau and myself are probably the most prolific in that regard for marine projects. Here is one um, that Dan started up on the nudibranchs and sea slugs of South Australia, which captures all the records that people um, put, uh, put onto the system. So it's very easy to join iNaturalist. The good thing about it is if you don't know what it is that you photograph, there's a whole lot of people out there who can help you right throughout the, the world. So there's a number of experts in, in all areas. Um, so there's not just sea slugs, many other animals on this site. So um, that's an example there if you want to find out more about sea slugs and about the different species, um, that would be a good platform. Okay, thank you for listening. We're nearly at the end now. I just wanted to briefly mention the values of sea slugs because often humans like to attribute value to everything. Um, so I just talk a little bit about the ecological value because sea slugs eat so many different kinds of things, they can help to control the coverage of things such as sponges or hydroids or bryozoans or even algae. And some of these could otherwise proliferate and reduce the species richness because some things grow very, very quickly and they can tend to take over an area. So in that way, the grazers can control things like that um, and, and um, the invertebrate eaters. Surprisingly, they also have medical value. There's a number of bioactive compounds, some of which are synthesized by the slugs themselves, but others that are taken up by their food. And these are being trialed in the treatment of, of tumors and other cancers. There's one um, in the second stage of um, tests at the moment for cervical cancer. Sea slugs are also used in research, some of them extensively so, um, for studies on learning and memory. And of course, they're very popular for tourism. They are popular subjects for divers and marine photographers. And some locations in the tropics, um, Tullamben in Bali and Lembe Straits um, and uh, Analeo, is that how you say it? <laughs> Analeo in the Philippines are some of the most famous spots for photographing nudibranchs and they attract international tourism. People love to go there to take pictures of slugs because they are beautiful. They are absolutely beautiful little animals. And so they do have an emotional value because when you see a sea slug, if you're in the water, they can actually make you feel happy to see them. They do have intrinsic value. Being part of the ocean ecosystem around the world, they have value just because they're there. And we don't really need to know all the values of sea slugs to appreciate them. It's good to know they're there. So I will finish there and I'll just say that there are a number of very cute little ones that are my favourites. So I had to include them. The little bat wing sea slug here and this little head shield slug that we found on York Peninsula and also this absolutely gorgeous little thing with the black eye spots, Ilbia Ilbi. So um, that's it for sea slugs. They're everywhere. They're small and they're cute and South Australia has very many of them. Thank you very much for listening. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was our last presentation for National Science Week. And I'd like to thank um, Inspiring Australia for funding tonight's presentation as well. But yeah, I've traveled around the world and I just can't get over the size, the difference in size and color and shape of all the needy branches you see around the world. It's incredible. It's extraordinary, absolutely. I, still, I can't They're believe I haven't special seen special animals. Yeah, I, I, still, I can't believe I haven't seen the shaggy sea hare because that's one of my favourite creatures to see here. And I haven't actually <laughs> seen the shaggy, <laughs> the shaggy sea hare. So that's just look turned up. For it. <laughs> yeah, look out for it. They're around. Um, Adrian found a whole lot of them in Marion Bay in 2018 and they're down here at Rapid Bay as well and a few other places. Okay. I don't think, I'm not sure if Ben Florence was referring to these because he said there's been a whole lot seen at KI. That sure. makes sense. Yeah, there, there is one particular one, uh, sea hare that breeds prolifically in Antichamber Bay. That's um, Aplesia sydneyensis, I think. And that has seasonal aggregations. Uh, that's quite a large one as well. So um, I'm not sure if Ben is, is 
referring to that hairy bursatella from WA or um, or the Sydneyensis, but yes, KI is certainly a very important area for breeding of that animal, the seagrass beds there. I'd like to um, show you that that, um, that nudibranch I saw at, at Rapid Bay. Absolutely, yesterday. yeah, the really, the long ceratosoma, that would be wonderful to see, I agree. Yeah, so that one was just sitting under, near the aquarium at the end of the jetty, and you couldn't miss it, it was probably <laughs> at least 15 centimetres long, it was, I've never seen anything like it. So we stopped and had a quick look at it. It's really fun. <laughs> on the, is it on the screen now? I can't. Yes, it is. Yeah, you can see okay. it and you can see the gills sticking up. And on the, yeah, on that side there, you can see the rhinophores. It is quite a long one. It's got a wavy kind of skirt around the edge of the mantle there. And you can see the diver there, Carly Newman's got a big smile on her face to see such <laughs> going past. She had just been swooped by a pied cormorant about 10 <laughs> minutes before that. So I think she was happy to see a slug after that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Frank rather than it. It's not attacking her from Jeff. Yes, Jeff, it is a monster. I agree. <laughs> Must be yeah. an old timer. <laughs> um, just wanted to say I was happy to see you. the new, the Neville the Neville Coleman books and stuff were part of my upbringing. My dad had a whole bookshelf of Neville Coleman books when I was really young, and I used to go through those when I was about like ten or twelve years old. Oh, and so inspiring. Yeah and incredible photography as well. That it's yeah. so many different, it's different books, the um, wonderful ones on um, sea stars and shells, all kinds of groups, yeah. Yeah, I hear that um, he did quite a bit of work in South Australia and Rob Lewis, the ex-chair of EMS, said that they went on a dive together and uh, Neville got into trouble and uh, Rob had to rescue him from that dive. <laughs> apparently he claims he saved his life back then. Oh, sure lucky he did. Happen. Yeah, he yeah. did a lot of work in um, Kangaroo Island in the 1970s. Oh, and, okay. Um, yeah, found some of the first records um, and also some of the deepest records when he went diving um, to about 40 metres over in the eastern Great Australian Bight. Yeah, he's, he's done some wonderful things. He's actually um, mm. was working with um, Sacred, helping us to identify some species back in 2011. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's yeah, a very, very sad loss. Very sad, yeah. Um, but his legend lives on and um, yeah. yeah, his books are still incredibly inspiring. And now there's an app, Gary Cobb and uh, Jorinda uh, van der west have put together an app of um, uh, sea slugs for ID based on Neville Coleman's book. Oh, okay. Um, and, yeah, yeah Jorinda right. used to work with Neville um, as a dive assistant back in the day. Um, yeah, so there's there's mm. a lot out there. Um, yeah, you'll never be forgotten, that's for sure. Absolutely. All right, well, I think uh, we're just about almost on eight o'clock and there's no more questions through, so I'll um, let you go. Thank you very much for your time again. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you too. It's been wonderful. And yeah, thanks thanks for the opportunity to to share about nerdy branks <laughs> for, <laughs> for all us nerds who love sea <laughs> And there's chats there. And if anyone does have any comments or questions, I'm very happy to answer them on Facebook or, um, yeah, have a chat. Um, find out a bit more about your own favourite experiences with sea slugs. 